Thank you, Cheryl. Um, Psalm 28, 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song, I praise him. So with joy in our hearts, would you please rise and join us as we give praise to our God. There's joy in the house of the Lord, and we won't be quiet. Come on, church. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. Party the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. Come on, sing it loud. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise, oh, oh, oh. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung upon that cross and he rose from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Cause we were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Let's sing that again. We are forgiven beggars, now we're royalty. We are the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout at your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout at your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is shut in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout at your praise. Oh, oh. We shout out your praise, oh, 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 we shout out your praise. Give God praise, amen. There was power in the name of Jesus. There was healing in the name of Jesus. This morning we sing to our God who breaks every stronghold, our God who shines through the shadows. Jesus. I just want to speak. 
speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus of Jesus' name over everything and invading every part of our life. Um, the only places where Jesus isn't is where we have put up um, blockades to letting Jesus in. When we come together and we confess, we break down those walls that we have built to let Jesus in. So I invite you now to join me in our prayer of confession together and then we will have some time to confess individually. 
Will you please pray with me? Almighty God, you created us for life together. You call us to serve one another, but we are tempted to think mostly about ourselves. You command us to love, knowing that in love we are fully alive, but we fail to love one another. Forgive and renew us to live in the light of your resurrection, that we might be filled with grace to live into our call to be the church of Jesus Christ. Hear now our silent confession. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Friends, receive the good news of forgiveness, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God through Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, I have the opportunity now to share with you some ways that you can get engaged and connected in the life of the church here at St. Peter's. If you take a look at your bulletin, if you're here joining us in worship in person, there are more details about these announcements in your bulletin and also on our website. We have several Bible studies that are available for you, um, both in person, but particularly online. There are details about our Bible studies that take place on Monday evenings, Wednesday mornings, missing the third one. It's a great thing. <laughs> uh, but all the details are in your bulletin, and if you're online with us this morning, you can catch them on our website also, but you are welcome to participate in those ongoing Bible studies um, where you can join with members of the community to dive deeper into Scripture. This Wednesday is an opportunity to participate in Laundry Love, where we uh, meet at a laundromat in San Pedro and provide quarters for those who need to get their laundry done. So um, there are also more details about that, how you can get connected to participating in that uh, very vital ministry um, in the bulletin and on our website. It may not look like it, but today is a beach day. Uh, the temperature may not be quite what we want it, but that also means uh, the UV's uh, uh, rating is very low today too. So low chance of sunburns. We're hoping that the sun does peak out a little bit, but we will be meeting after church um, at Torrance Beach at the, at the bottom of the ramp at the farthest part of the parking lot that's closest to Palos Verdes here. So the closest part of the parking lot you'd be able to meet at and head down that ramp. We will be there after worship, bring a lunch, and it'll just be a time to be together. Um, maybe bring a sweatshirt though too, just in case. <laughs> um, we will have some sand toys and some drinks and some treats for those who show up. We'd love to see you there. Um, and with that, there is no high school or middle school group meeting today because of each day. But some other news for both our third through fifth graders and our middle school and high school students. We have summer camp registration is opening this week. Our high school and middle school students will be going to Sugar Pine Camp and our third through fifth graders will be going to Calvin Crest Sherwood Forest. Um, they are both located right outside of Oakhurst and that is gonna be July 9th through 14th. You can sign up individually at those websites and then we'll register with us as well so we can coordinate transportation to get up there. There will be emails going out this week with all the details about registering for summer camp. 
And then the very following week is Vacation Bible School here on campus here. And that'll be July 17th through 21st for kids from TK through fifth grade. Registration is open for that on our website. We would love to have you join us. If you are in middle school or older, we would love to have you volunteer. There is a way for everybody to volunteer with VVS. <laughs> so um, we would love to have you participate in whatever way you can. And I think that's all the answers I have. I would like to welcome up um, Pastor Paul. He has some special things to share this morning. Awesome. Uh, good to be here this morning. And what a gift it is to welcome some of our newest members um, here to St. Peter's by the Sea. Um, some of these will be familiar faces. Uh, some of these will be brand new faces. Um, if you are brand new with us this morning, then maybe your face will be up here um, one day as well if you sense God's call. Um, to kind of step, uh, step toward, lean into this community um, of St. Peter's. Um, I'd like all our new members to come forward. Um, you can identify them this morning. They're wearing these boutonnieres, so come on up. And then I will introduce you guys by names. Elders um, who were present uh, the morning that we met with them, if you all want to come up as well. Mike, we do have a boutonniere for you. Okay, all right, all right. Right on. Well, these are our newest members, and most of them are here this morning. Um, I just want to introduce them to you so you get a feel of who is with us this morning. This is Susan um, Burns, and Susan is a longtime resident of Palos Verdes. Uh, she um, has been part of St. Peter's before. She found her way back um, in recent um, seasons and really is excited to be here. Her daughter, Danielle, works the nursery. Um, it, she is uh, uh, with Jeff, husband. Okay, uh, Jeff and husband is her husband, and um, Parker and TJ are her grandchildren, um, so we welcome you. Um, this is Sandra and John O'Neill. Um, they found us. They are active in their Presbyterian church in Michigan. Um, they reside here uh, about a quarter of the year now, half the year now. All right. Um, we are wooing them to the, uh, Southern California. Um, they will eventually end up here full time, but right now they're going to hold dual membership in both their Presbyterian churches because Michigan is nice in the summer, they tell us. Um, so they'll be headed out uh, soon, but um, we welcome you and we're so grateful for your presence. Uh, Mary Larson, Mary Larson comes to us from uh, of the Methodist tradition, a Methodist church. She found us, she's very involved. She's already a Stephen minister here. And Mary is grandmother to the Kidder clan. Um, so if any of you know all the Kidders, um, Lyle, Kevin, Mackenzie, those are her grandchildren, at least some of them. Um, Lisa's her daughter, so um, great joy, Mary, that you're with us. Mercy Corlew, Mercy, um, you know what? Mercy found us, um, you know, God provided, right? Um, Mercy was praying about going on a mission trip. She signed up with Amor Ministries. Um, she got placed with our like 20 people going on an Amor trip and one of her. And um, she just found her way to us and found her way into this community. Um, we uh, are so grateful for you, Mercy. She's already volunteering with the high school program. She's already gone on another mission trip with high schoolers. So Mercy, um, we give great thanks to God for you. Um, Mercy lives in Los Angeles and she does a lot of stuff, cool stuff in the entertainment industry. Um, this is Tim O'Hare. Tim it comes to us um, via La Cañada Presbyterian Church. Uh, longtime member there. Um, he and his family moved out here um, during the pandemic, right? Um, he found us online and through the Boy Scouts, um, which are the, our troop here at St. Peter's. Um, Tim is a lifelong Presbyterian. When he shared his story, um, my word, you don't get any more Presbyterian than you in all the best ways. And so we are grateful for you. <laughs> Um, right here we have Stephen Johnson. Stephen comes to us from Hollywood Presbyterian Church. He grew up in Palos Verdes. In fact, for those of you who know Dean Hanley right over here, um, Dean Hanley and Steve, when they were high schoolers, swam against each other um, here in Palos Verdes. And Dean won. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. Well... Um, Steve and his wife Raquel are um, here, a part of this community. Steve's already on our finance committee and working, bringing gifts that he used at Hollywood Press and here at St. Peter's, and we are grateful for you. Um, we have Michael and Kara Stewerwald right here, and um, Kara's name in the bulletin says Kira. 
oh my gosh, if there's anything I drives me crazy, it's when we get names wrong. So I apologize, it's Kara. They've actually um, been very familiar faces here for um, many years, and they actually said, we didn't know we weren't members. Um, uh, um, but you know, that just um, kind of goes to the ways in which um, this community comes around each other and it lives life and does life together. Um, they have two sons, um, Brendan and Gavin, and um, we rejoice the two of you are here and um, taking this step today. Mike Brogan, all right, I got an email about him a couple, week, uh, couple months ago. Um, he is a member from Beverly Hills Presbyterian Church, moved his family to Palos Verdes during the pandemic? Just before the pandemic. Um, my friend Andrew, my good friend who is pastor at Beverly Hills, um, he said, I got a friend who's moving over to Palos Verdes, and I told him that I think um, you're the church that he would find community with. In fact, I think your church might be a better fit than Beverly Hills. And so um, we rejoice that you're here, Mike, and have found St. Peter's. And then Jen Langner, Jen right back here. Um, Jen has been part of this church for many seasons. Her son, they found St. Peter's by their son Jordan growing up here at St. Peter's, going through the, the youth programs. Jordan um, went to UCSD. He's now on, inter, or not InterVarsity, Campus Crusade staff with the University of, San Diego, University of Cal State San Diego. Um, Jen uh, has already been involved here in so many ways. She's committed to um, worship and youth ministries. Um, Jen's husband, Jim, is also joining this morning, but he couldn't be with us. Um, and he's retired military, and they um, live locally in San Pedro. So we give thanks to God for you. Um, so let's just put our hands and our hearts together for welcoming these folks. Laura Hanley is up here. She is one of our elders here at St. Peter's. Um, Laura uh, is part of the welcoming and connecting folks to St. Peter's. Um, TJ Johnson, another one of our elders, was a part of receiving these new members, as was Alex Perez. Um, so the session has joyfully received these folks into membership. So I'm gonna ask the membership questions to all of you. Um, trusting in the gracious uh, mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, say, I do. I do. And do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his gracious love? Now, I know that many of you have already accepted him and committed to him, so maybe it's again acknowledged. Um, but if so, say, I do. I do. And will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, say, I will. And will you be a faithful member of this congregation, sharing in its worship and ministry through your gifts of prayer and the gifts that God has uniquely given to you? If so, say, I will. I will. And do all of you, uh, you know, in, in true Reformed tradition and in the ways that we Presbyterians like to gather, um, any call, any uh, call to community is a covenantal relationship, um, that in which you all play a part as well. So these folks take the step of saying, yes, I want to be a part of this community. They sense God's call in affirming that. And then um, all of you say, yes, we will be praying for you. Um, when there's joy in your life, we will be joyful with you. When there is struggle in your life, we will struggle with you. Um, when there is burden in your life, we will carry that burden with you. Um, when there is love in your life, we will love with you. And so um, to all of you, I say, do you uh, acknowledge and accept and receive these new members um, joyfully? If so, say amen. amen. If so, say amen. 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 So I didn't like to invite any elders who are present with us this morning um, to just come and put, lay hands on these folks. Any elders who are present with us this morning, just lay hands maybe on a shoulder. All right, and then I'd like to invite any children who are f um, with us this morning to come forward, and you guys can have a front row seat um, to this laying on of hands. So any children who are with us, you guys can come right up here and sit right up front. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So we're going to bow our heads and our hearts, and we're going to pray for these friends, all right? So let's pray together. Um, God, we thank you for community. We thank you that you call us in different seasons to be a part of different communities. Sometimes 
Um, it's finding community for the first time in your name. Other times it means letting go of leaving a community that's been meaningful to us, that's grown us, that's loved us. It's an act of faith to let go so that we can step into a new season of life, a new season of faith. And so we thank you that the stories of these 12 that stand before us um, are rich and deep and valued and loved in your sight. We thank you that you are God in their lives, that you are Lord. We thank you for the gifts they already bring, the gifts they will bring. We pray that when their well is full, that um, we would stand around them and with them joyfully as they serve others from that well, and when their well is empty, when it's dry, we pray that we would be a tangible way of filling their wells so that they are replenished by you, Jesus, the living water. God, we thank you for new members, for the life they bring, for the sign that it is that we will see in this morning's scripture that um, when multitudes gather in your name, that indeed it's because your Holy Spirit is empowering, is moving, is growing, And so we thank you. This is a visible, a tangible witness of your goodness, of your grace. We pray for Steve and for Sandra, for John, for Mike, for Jennifer, for Jim, for Kara, for Michael, for Mary, for Susan, for Tim, and and for Mercy. And we pray, God, for their families, that you would um, give them places of belonging here as well, their households deep places of meaning in this community. Um, Our hearts are glad, and we are grateful. We thank you for these friends, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to have you guys stand here for just a moment, and we're going to give our children's blessing. As we always say um, in this worship service, um, as our children prepare to leave to their um, continued worship, we say to them, may God be with you there. And the children say to us, May God be with you here. All right. Anna would like to remind you to pick your children up after worship <laughs> in the classrooms across the patio. God bless y'all. We're thankful. me now there you go I got this big light coming at me like the Holy Spirit as you can see the shine upon me good morning church and to those of you out there streaming this morning it's just great to be in church to be in community and to be in community with each and every one of you I did um, it's amazing how God works because in my writing he left something out and that is the fact that I want to thank him first for the gift the gift of the new members God is always giving to us, and God is a very cheerful giver. So, once again, let's give thanks to let's give thanks to God for His gift as we prepare ourselves for this time of um, offering. Um, the Apostle Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter eight, verses seven, he said, "Just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge." and asking me in knowledge, and in earnest, and of course, and in love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving, to excel in the grace of giving. As a Christian community, it's important for us to support the needs of St. Peter's and all of its ministries and administration. This allows us to support individuals in our church as well as our surrounding community. You can give online at www.stpeters.org through Venmo using um, ampersign St. Peter's by the Sea by mailing us a check and our address is on the website or you can leave donations in the trays as you leave. St. Mother Teresa once said, it is not how much we give but how much love we put into it. Let me repeat that again so it can sink in one more time. It's not how much we give 
but how much love we put into it. I pray that each of you will turn your hearts towards the Holy Spirit to guide you in your giving consideration in this season. Thank you. Thank you for that offering. The event of Easter in the life of the church is a season, not just a single Sunday. Today is the fourth Sunday of Easter, and we find ourselves in the fourth chapter of the New Testament book of Acts. 
These words from Luke, the author of Acts, offer another glimpse of living between the now and the not yet. Listen to the word of God from Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 20. The next day, the rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners, Peter and John, stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are being asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered them to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They said, what will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite Pastor Paul forward. Let us pray together in preparation for hearing the preached word. O oh God, may the word words of Pastor Paul's mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and honoring to you. Teach us more about what it means to be your resurrection people, individually and together, as followers of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to start with acknowledging that we have um, one of the longtime pillars of St. Peter's by the Sea in our presence this morning. Um, Bob Maxwell is in the house this morning. Um, Bob and his daughter Ashley are, are, are visiting, but will always um, be welcome, and this will be a home for them. Bob was a, a pillar member with his wife, McNair. Um, your legacy, um, Bob and McNair together, um, lives and breathes. There were people this morning asking me, now is this the Bob that was married to McNair? And there are people that have come to St. Peter's since you left. So your legacy burns bright. Uh, McNair and Bob moved a few years ago to South Carolina 
to, um, you know, if you knew McNair, she was as Presbyterian and as Southern as they come. And they moved to be closer to her Presbyterian roots. And McNair passed away. And so Bob moved back to the West Coast and to be closer to their children, Ashley and Reynolds. And um, we are just so grateful, Ashley and Bob, that you are here this morning. Um, a great joy for all of us. Um, as we um, acknowledge and are reminded that we have pillar members of this church, um, you know, again, what a delight to welcome this, our newest members um, to St. Peter's. One of the, the gifts that I have as pastor and some of our elders have is we gather with new members um, to talk about what God is doing at St. Peter's, um, to hear their faith stories, to hear what God is doing in their life, and then to look for the intersection um, to help them discern if this is a place where God might be calling them to live out these chapters of their faith. It is always sacred ground. And what it reminds me of as I you know, was naming each person this morning and giving you a, a glimpse of who they are, what it reminds me of is that every one of us has a story. Every one of us has a memory that um, we can call up, that remind us of their significance and, and, and the ways in which they, those memories and those uh, stories um, have been a part of shaping who we have become and who we are becoming. For better, hopefully, right? And sometimes for complexity as well. But those stories make up who we are. My wife, some of you know her, many of you know her. She is a clinical psychologist. She tells, I remember um, after our oldest turned three years old, she looked at me and she said, well, we're done. And I said, what? And she said, congratulations, we're done. And she said, um, the first three years of a child's life are the most formative years of a child's life. Pretty much you've taught them everything they need to know. Wow, oh my gosh. That was and no pressure there. But um, it tells you, again, just, you know, as you look back on our lives, the, 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 the ways in which stories and experiences um, shape us um, and who we are. And every one of us can probably think back to um, visions that we once had, right? Do you remember, like, um, you know, the little, you know, Beth or the little um, Mercy or the little Travis, you know, the little Doug, the little Heather? Do you remember, you know, when you were a child, and you were thinking, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up? I want to be a fireman. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a professional athlete. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a veterinarian. I want to be an astronaut is what three-year-old Paul wanted to be. But from a very early age, there was um, something that I sensed, and it was probably an odd, peculiar calling for a three-year-old. But from the very earliest of ages, I remember the one thing that kind of just burned deep and burned bright in my heart. Was I knew God was calling me to be a father. That one day I would be a father. Now, no doubt... That calling was born out of um, some of the formative experiences that I had as a child. But I knew that God was calling me to be a father through many different seasons of faith and life, some more turbulent than others. This dream, this calling, it never wavered. A lot of other things fell away. I changed majors, I changed degrees, I changed colleges. But the one thing that remained constant was the sense of one day I'm going to be a father. And oftentimes, the reason that that dream never wavered, the reason that I didn't throw in the towel, was because of the Peters and Johns. Like Laura just read about, the Peters and Johns, the Marys and Marthas in my life who bore witness, who believed with me, who said, don't give up. Now, before we get to the part of the story that Lord just read for us, I, I, I do think, um, I'm going to ask you to hold on to what I just shared because I'm going to come back, but I do think it's helpful to kind of back up and think about what happened in chapter 3, the, the chapter right before Laura just read for us, because I think it sets the scene. And what's happening is crowds have gathered, and James and John are kind of at the, 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 the doors and the entry of the temple. 
And there's a lot going on. There's a lot playing itself out. You know, it's kind of like, um, you know, you imagine like the, the buildup in the movie. You know, there's a lot of drama happening. And suddenly this man who is, hasn't been able to walk, he appears. And he hasn't been able to walk since he was born. And he's put right into their path, into the disciples' path, Peter and, and John. And the man, this man, he assumes that Peter and John will heal him, that somehow they will um, give him some sort of assistance. You know, they're thinking, they're, you know, certainly Peter's going to do something. But it isn't what Peter does as much as what he says that kind of grabs our attention, right? Peter says, I have no silver or gold. I have no silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And you know what happens in the text next is pretty amazing. The man discovers that his feet and his ankles have been miraculously healed. I mean, it's hard not to imagine, you know, what would we do if we were put in that position? What would you do if you were this man? We might imagine that he reacts with the enthusiasm of his younger years, right? All of a sudden, his legs and his ankles are restored, and he's jumping, leaping around for joy, praising God. There's a a professor um, named Rob Wall. He was a mentor to many of um, my former younger staff and my former church who went to the university he taught at. Um, He writes this about this passage. He says, Peter's command is not the incantation of a magician. As though healing powers were released by mere mention of a sacred name, but but Peter's command was a believer's confession of the continuing authority of the living Jesus. In other words, what he's saying, it's not hocus pocus, it's not some magic formula, it's Peter's confession. His profession of faith, his witness that Jesus is alive and the Spirit of God is at work among them. That is why I think we see new members joining St. Peter's, because it is their confession or their profession that in some way they sense that Jesus Christ is alive and moving and growing at St. Peter's. And that's what's happening, um, you know, leading up to the story that, that Laura read for us this morning. And the authorities, they do not like what is happening. And so what do they do? They have Peter and John arrested and imprisoned. And now that kind of lands us. It ushers us right up to where Laura um, began her reading this morning. It's the beginning of chapter 4. It's the day after the arrest. The picture is that of the authority, the temples, uh, the authorities of the temple. They're sort of scrambling. They're kind of, you know, what is happening? They're trying to figure out what is going on. And so they say to him, by what power, by what power, by what name did you do this? And then Peter says something that I think you'd only have the courage to say if you were indeed um, filled with, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He says, rulers and elders of the people. Basically, he's speaking to, you know, the authorities that are there. He's saying, rulers and elders of the people, if we have been brought to trial today for helping a sick man put under investigation regarding this healing, I'll be frank with you. I'm going to just put it out there. We have nothing to hide. By the name of Jesus Christ, the one, who, the one who you put to death on a cross, the one God raised from the dead, by means of Jesus' name, this man stands before you healthy and whole. Now, we can imagine the authorities. They're, they're the ones in charge, right? They can be thinking. They're probably thinking many things. They're confused. They're frustrated. They're offended. They're angry. And maybe they're jealous. Verse 2 tells us that they're annoyed. That the crowds, believing the disciples' witness of Jesus' resurrection, that um, those crowds are growing, those crowds keep multiplying, numbering as many as 5,000. So if we stop and we settle ourselves into the text and we understand and we think about what is happening, it's telling us that the witness of the gospel, when it is unleashed and when empowered by the Holy Spirit, 
It changes things. It changes everything. Just as Jesus had promised. Now the story concludes with the leaders ordering Peter and John to never speak, a name, never speak the name or teach in the name of Jesus again. But Peter says this. He says, whether it's right in God's eyes to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. But for us, there's no question. We cannot be quiet about what we have seen and heard. That opening song that we sang in worship today, there was a line in there that resonated with, we cannot be quiet about what we have seen and heard. I mean, that's amazing. That phrase has, has just been playing and replaying in my mind all week. We cannot keep quiet about what we have seen and heard. And I can't stop thinking about the fact that these words were so passionately offered in the context of what? A healing. I mean, do we live as if we believe in a God who empowers his followers? And I'm saying this humbly. I'm not saying this like pointing fingers. I'm, I'm asking with humility with my own personal, like, inward looking at my heart, do we live as if we believe in a God who empowers his followers, each and every one of us, to act in such ways? Do we see ourselves, as verse 13 so beautifully states, as companions of Jesus? As verse 8 reminds us, as ones filled by the power of the Holy Spirit, can we even, should we even, dare we even be bold on our own? Well, Luke, the author of Acts, is pretty clear that it's only when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. I'll digress and just say, if you are familiar with St. Peter's mission statement, the very first words of that mission statement are what? Empowered by the Holy Spirit. Empowered we are by the Holy Spirit, we are a community that glorifies God, grows followers of Christ, and meets human need, deed. Luke is perfectly clear, very clear, that it's only when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit that we're able to have such bold faith and to pray for things such as healings. Um, a, a part of our worship service that um, is featured probably two times a month. Um, it's been something that's become part of the fabric, the meaningful fabric of what we do. It's called knowing and being known time. And because we are known by God, we know God and we are known by God, then we um, feel a call to know one another and be known by one another. So someone is invited up here to give a testimony of the way in which you know, God is working that out in their lives. And so um, we don't have one this morning, but I've been earnestly and prayerfully searching for someone to share a brief testimony about a time when they were waiting, about a time when they were longing for God to show up, hoping that they, they would be willing to provide some sort of witness about their own journey with God in that way. You know, the more I asked, the more I kept coming up short. But the more I leaned in, I realized that the person that was I'm supposed to share was me. <laughs> and it became um, kind of clear when one of you said to me, it's you, Paul, you're the one who's supposed to fill that spot. So uh, kind of for the next few minutes, I'm going to stand here as a pastor, maybe pastor to many of you, but also as one of you to give a witness about something in my life that I cannot keep quiet about because of God's goodness, God's faithfulness. Almost 14 years ago, Devin and I experienced, um, Devin is my wife, for those of you who don't know, Devin and I experienced the unimaginable when we received the news that a long-awaited adoption failed just minutes before we were to bring that baby home with us from the hospital. We've been journeying with that person for five months. Before I go on, I want you to know that I have all of my family members' permission to share this part of our family story. 
for context, this failed adoption came on the heels of several arduous years of trying to conceive a pregnancy through the wonders of modern medicine. Now, as a pastor myself and as a psychologist, my wife, our lives were and are very visible in the church communities that we are a part of, in the communities in which we reside. And this was no different in our former context. Everyone in that community, the congregation, um, the people that we knew, our neighbors, everyone was excited with us. And then everyone was devastated for us when that adoption failed. My boss and my senior pastor at the time, I was the youth and family pastor, um, he had a hard work ethic. I mean, you had to work, work, work when you worked with him and for him. But he was, interestingly, the first one who said to me, leave. Leave for as long as you two need to leave. Go take care of each other. Go take care of yourselves. My only encouragement is that you get as far away from here as possible. And so we did. We did what every grieving soul should be able to do. We purchased airfare to Hawaii. <laughs> because of a gracious gift of a very generous friend with mileage, um, we got a way to isolate ourselves. And, you know, that was before that term had global baggage. And it was a good thing. We got a way to isolate ourselves and to allow, allow our souls to heal. We were unapologetically escaping because wherever we went after that failed adoption, there was some kind, loving soul who would innocently ask, where's the baby? And we'd have to tell and relive the story again and again. When we were in Hawaii, those first couple days, I remember every evening, Devin and I would um, float in the ocean. We love uh, just hanging out in the ocean. At night, um, as it's going dark, we would watch the sunset. We would cry. We would cry a lot. We would lament. We would laugh some. We would play. We would do whatever we needed to do to end the day and to muster up some sort of hope for the next day. I'll never forget those conversations between us. With enormous tears in her eyes, and you know Devin, she's a strong person. With enormous tears in her eyes, her broken spirit, I remember one night she looked at me and she said, I, I can't do this anymore. The only way I can possibly try adoption again is if a child has already been born and if it can happen as quickly as possible. I lovingly smiled and I held her, thinking to myself, as if that's ever going to happen. That has been our hope for a scenario for almost two years and it hasn't come to pass. Two days later, might have even been a day later, actually it was just a no, two days later. Two days later, the phone rings at 6.30 a.m. We're in Hawaii on the other end. It's our social worker who somewhat cautiously greeted me saying, Paul, I am so sorry to call so early. She thought she was calling me in Seattle. She had no idea that we were actually two hours behind in Hawaii. She had no clue that we were at such a distance. She went on to say, um, I don't even know if I should be calling you right now given all that you and Devin have been through but I just had to call. This little girl has been born this morning. And she fits your profile to the T. With your permission, we'd like to show the birth mother your profile. Our reply, quite honestly, completely lacked any measure of faith. <laughs> any measure of belief that this could be the one. And so we said, sure, why not? Go for it, what do we have to lose? Well, for those that know the story, you know that we won the lottery that day. I had waited 35 years for my dream, my calling to be a father come to fruition. Some might argue that I wasn't fit to be a father at three years old. So maybe God had good wisdom in holding back on that promise. 
But every day, Devin and I give thanks for God's goodness and faithfulness in giving us Maya Elizabeth Katiri Singh Barrett. Yes, both of our kids have the longest names amid their groups of friends. <laughs> Maya, she is a blessing to us in every sense of the word. And the blessing is also a reminder to us that following Jesus is oftentimes really complex. So many times along this journey, good and well-intentioned well people have said to us, well, doesn't it all make sense now? Now that Maya is here, don't you see why God put you through all that you went through? And I will be honest with you and tell you that our truest response is no. Actually, very little of it makes sense. But one day we look forward to a conversation with God about it. However, what we can say is this. We would do it all again if we knew that Maya was coming into our lives. But again, there lies the complexity, right? Most of us don't have or will ever have the knowledge or the ability to know how any given circumstance or situation in our lives individually or collectively is going to play out. But what we do have, what we do have is this, that on our good days and on our bad days and to the best of our human ability, we can seek and we can continue to seek and to believe and to trust and to follow a God who gives us the ability to imagine and reimagine all sorts of possibilities, not because of our resources or our abilities, but because of the hope made available to us by the resurrection of our risen Lord Jesus and by the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit who lives and dwells among us. For us... Maya and later Miles, we defied the odds. We won the lottery twice. For us, Maya and Miles' arrivals didn't and they don't resolve all our questions or our longings or our frustrations or our laments for God. However, we do believe that one of the realities of human life and of the biblical story, the biblical witness, is that we cannot limit any one moment or any one situation of either to a single event or context. We must always, always consider the larger picture, the whole witness, the entire story to even begin to grasp its fullness. And it's in those moments, it's in those moments when I can clearly see that the God who put the call to fatherhood on the three, on the heart of the three-year-old Paul is the same God who brought Maya and Miles into our life, come what may. I never, never imagined that the journey to parenthood would and could be so complex. But here I am, and here I am, and I cannot help but give a witness with all of my heart and everything I am, I believe in the healing power of Jesus. Does healing always take the forms that we want it to? Unfortunately, no. But I do believe in the Apostle Paul's words in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I only know in part then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now, this is where some traditions would call out and they would ask, can I get a witness? And one of you would say, mm-hmm, that's right, it's me, pastor, I got a witness, I can't be quiet about it, I can't be quiet about what I've seen and heard, don't worry, I'm not gonna put you on the spot like that, but I guess I am curious. Do you have a witness? Do you have a story to tell that you cannot keep quiet about? Where are the places in your life and in our life together that God is calling us to, to claim 
healing and wholeness by the power of Christ's resurrection and by the presence of God's Holy Spirit among us. I am not suggesting the hypothetical. I'm really asking it. Maybe it's in here, maybe it's out there. Maybe it's out there when you drive to work, when you get on a freeway, when you go into a classroom, when you step onto whatever work environment is your work environment. So I'll say it again, where are the places in your life, in our life together, that God is calling us, God is calling you to claim the healing, to claim healing and wholeness in the power of Christ's resurrection. May the Holy Spirit speak to each and every one of us. Speak to our hearts, O God, for we are listening. May God give us the courage to claim the fullness of our stories in light of the fullness of God's resurrection in Jesus. Trusting, believing, knowing that God is God and we are not and we don't have to be. That God is a God who keeps God's promises. That God is a God of healing and wholeness. That God is our God. And we do have a witness. You do have a witness. Do not be quiet about it. May it be so, and may we be so. Amen and amen. Let us pray as a family. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of life as a resurrected people, for the gift of your son Jesus who gave his whole self for us, your beloved children, and for the gift of the Holy Spirit who empowers and sustains us Lead us through the trials of this life, the suffering and the sorrow, the challenges and the struggles, the tired times, and the dark places. This morning we remember specifically those beloved in our church family who need healing. Nancy, Frank, Marion, Caleb, Jean, and Nick. Be with those who weep or cannot sleep, who have no peace, who seek release. Lead us with grace and love and peace. We're so thankful for those making the commitment of membership today to your church in this place at this time. Bless them and their families and all of us as we grow deeper and broader in community and witness. Fill us with hope, with patience, and with stamina to do the work to which you have called us. Transform us to grow, to understand, and to see your people and your world as you see them. Transform us so that we can be made whole, and in wholeness may we be the hands and heart of Jesus our Savior, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Would you please rise and join us for our closing hymn, Amazing Grace, number 280 in your hymnal.
always a gift to be in this space together for these uh, Sundays of worship. Um, however you find yourself coming into this space this morning, whether this is your regular place of worship or you're brand new with us, um, we want to extend a very special welcome um, to you. You know, I say this um, often and I'll say it again, you know, because we have new members, we have tenured members, we have pillar members that have been here for many years among us. Um, you know, if you are someone who is looking for a faith community and you're looking for the community that gets it right, you know, hits the target every time, um, you know, completes the play, whatever it is that you're looking for, um, you know, and never messes up, then run from us um, because, you know, we're flawed. Um, but we do seek to be faithful. We do seek to create space um, where we can live um, the things that God puts on our hearts and gives us stories that we cannot be quiet about and that God would continue to grow us in our numbers and the ways in which we um, have a reach into the worlds that God uniquely entrusts to us. Um, you know, behind me, we have this magnificent organ. I was at a memorial service a couple days ago up in Yosemite and the place was packed and the organ was just, you know, it was all contained in, in, in the organ itself, like the, the actual playing organ, the everything. And I was reminded just what a beautiful instrument um, we have. And sometimes it's really easy to take it for granted. And so, um, you know, one of the gifts we have in worship immediately um, after the benediction is um, there's a postlude. And if that is something that would, um, you know, move your soul, that is something that would stir um, you to a place of, you know, just um, healing and a place of um, joy um, and being with God, then we invite you to stay and remain seated and enjoy that. And for anyone else, we invite you to um, just exit and join us on the patio. And um, Bob Maxwell will be holding space in the fireside room this morning um, for a good while. So if you want to visit with Bob, he will enjoy that as well. And friends, as we go from this place, um, know that you are loved. If you are someone who needs spiritual, emotional, physical healing in your life, we have caring ministries available to you in many forms. Just give us a call and we'll reach back very quickly. We want to um, provide, especially when God stirs things on our hearts. Um, but as we go from this place, may the deep love of God, the grace, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and friendship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all until we meet again. Go in peace to love and serve our God. And the people of God would say? Amen. That's right. Amen. Go in peace.
Love.